So welcome to this tutorial which is going to give an overview of the pyro solver. So first of all let's create a very very basic pyro simulation which will give us the chance to have a look at some of the parameters. So I'm going to lay down a sphere uh, and then I'm going to use just the flames shelf tool here on the shelf and that produces this basic setup. I'm going to change this so that we're hiding other objects and we can see that our flames are rather rather dull here so I'm going to increase the density of the visualization of our simulation and I can do that here. Uh, you can see all we're, all we're visualizing at the moment is this multi-field parameter here on the pyro node. So if I go into the multi-field I can increase the density scale like this and that should mean that I get a, a brighter simulation. There we are. So we can see uh, that we've got a simulation which is creating flames and smoke. And what I'm going to do in this tutorial is take you through the process that the pyro shader is using to create that flame, those flames and smoke, and then look in a bit more detail at the meaning of the various parameters and the effects that they can have. Well, let's have a look at the basic process uh, that the pyro solver is using to simulate pyro effects. And what I'm concentrating on here is the so-called combustion model. You don't have to use the combustion model with the pyro solver, but in practice the pyro solver is almost always used with the combustion model. And in the combustion model, rather than emitting your smoke and flames directly from your source, your source tends to emit fuel. The fuel is ignited if the temperature is high enough, and the resulting reaction produces flames, smoke, increases the temperature of your simulation and possibly it expands the flame and smoke uh, in the way that you would expect for example in a fireball where the hot gases generated as part of the explosion push outward. And of course the temperature also affects the movement of your smoke and your flames because they will tend to, arri to rise uh, because of the buoyancy effect of the hot gas. Now let's have a look and see at what fields are used to represent these quantities in the pyrosolver. So the fuel is represented by the fuel field. The flames are represented by a field which is called heat. The smoke is represented by a field called density. The temperature is represented by temperature. And expansion is controlled by the divergence field. And you can visualize all of these fields and and we'll have a look at a few of them in a moment. There is an additional field called burn, and the burn field represents the intermediate stage as the fuel is used up and the flames and the smoke and so on are produced. The difference between heat and burn is that heat can persist for a number of frames after, for example, the fuel is all used up. You can imagine a situation where you have uh, some fuel burning, you cut off the source of the fuel, and the flames would continue for a few moments afterwards and then evaporate. So the heat field persists from frame to frame. The burn field is just recalculated on every frame. As soon as the fuel runs out, your burn field would disappear to nothing. So let's have a look again at what those main variables are. Fuel, that's what you burn. Temperature, this influences whether or not your fuel will ignite and also how fast your smoke and flames will rise. Burn, that's the temporary field I was referring to, which represents the process of converting fuel into smoke and flames. Density, that's your smoke. Now you may think you can get away without calculating the smoke and you might want to turn off the control on the pyrosolver which emits smoke. 
but in fact in order to render properly you always need a density field. Now it's usually easiest therefore just to continue to emit smoke even if you don't need it and then simply not render it because you can you can turn off the rendering of smoke in the pyro shader. You could if you wanted decide not to emit smoke but you'd then have to recreate uh, a density field for example by duplicating the heat field and, and renaming it as density before you render. Heat, that's your flames. And then divergence, as I mentioned, determines whether your smoke and flames expand outwards. So ha let's have a look now at the actual process that takes place uh, when we calculate a pyro effect, when we calculate combustion. So the first thing that happens is that the solver will check that the temperature is high enough to ignite the fuel. Now, in general, you don't need to worry about this because the shelf tools will set up a source for you which sources both fuel and temperature, and the temp temperature will always be enough to ignite the fuel that is emerging. So the first thing it does after that is to set this burn field to the fuel that's available times the burn rate. So you can control how rapidly the fuel is being consumed by the burn rate. Then it uh, creates smoke from that burning and it creates it uh, from something called soot rate which is also known as smoke amount. So you can control how much smoke is produced. It then creates heat and the heat is the maximum of the heat that's already there, in other words the flames that are already there, and this burn field. So the burn field will only increase the flames in areas where the flame field is lower than the burn field. It then increases the divergence by looking at the burn field, looking at the gas release parameter, and looking at the burn influence parameter. So this means that it will expand the hot gases depending, broadly speaking, on the gas release parameter. It then increases the temperature by the heat output and the burn influence parameters depending on the burn field. Again, the main control is really the heat output control. Uh, and the temperature, of course, determines how fast your smoke and flames are rising. And then finally, it uses up the fuel by subtracting uh, the burn field times 1 minus fuel inefficiency. Now, as I said earlier, in general, your simulations are going to have a continuous source of fuel being emitted, and you don't really need to worry about how rapidly the fuel is being used up because it's being refreshed at every frame. But in some circumstances, for example, where you've animated the source so that it just emits fuel for a few frames, uh, you, can, you will need to worry about how fast the fuel is being used up. So just to recap what depends on what. So your smoke will depend on the amount of fuel you've got, the burn rate, and the smoke amount parameter, which is also called the soot rate. The flames, that's your heat field, depends on the fuel and the burn rate. The temperature, and therefore how fast things are rising, depends on the fuel, the burn rate, the flame contribution, and the burn contribution. Now I should mention a flame contribution and burn contribution here. Throughout the solver, uh, you can choose to affect the temperature uh, by both the effect of the flame, in other words the heat field, or the instantaneous burn reaction. The difference here is that uh, if your flames linger on, they can continue to generate temperature after the burn has reduced to zero. And finally, the expansion, divergence, depends on the fuel, the burn rate, like everything else, but also the gas released parameter. So I've got a setup here which consists of two separate pyro simulations and this is going to enable me to compare the effect of changing 
parameters here on the left PyroSolver compared to the standard default parameters. And indeed, I've set up some takes here which allow us to visualize some of the parameters and what they do. And I'll ensure this file is, is saved with the project file so that you can have a look at this yourself. So let's just expand this and have a look at how the PyroSolver is constructed. So the first tab here contains some broad parameters which are basically applicable across the board and are some of the sort of fundamental controls that determine how your simulation is going to look. The combustion tab is what controls the combustion process that I described earlier and we'll have a look at some of these parameters. The ones at the top here are common to the production of smoke, the production of flames, the increase in temperature and so on. These tend to affect all of those, broadly speaking, uh, whereas the more detailed controls are down here uh, and these enable you to determine exactly how your uh, flames, smoke, the expansion of your gas, the increase in temperature and so on are going to be affected. The shape tab is what allows you to add turbulence, noise and various other effects to shape your simulation and make it look much more interesting. The relationships tab is used only if you are using the old-fashioned, that is Houdini 11 and before, method of sourcing and pumps where you set up a relationship between the source object and your simulation. We're not going to use these today, so I'm going to turn off those. And finally, the advanced tab is to do with how your simulation runs, and it's really beyond the scope of this tutorial. I'm not going to go into uh, the meaning of these tabs here. So let's just have a little look at this first tab, the simulation controls. Now obviously the time scale determines how rapidly uh, your simulation progresses. It's just a global scale which allows you to slow down your simulation if you would like. The temperature diffusion determines how your temperature field blurs. And in general, unless you're using uh, a model which requires it, you, you can usually keep this at its default value. The cooling rate determines how fast your gas will cool down, and we'll have a look at that in a second. Viscosity I'm not going to cover. It, it tends to make your gas, your smoke, appear a little bit thicker. Buoyancy lift, of course, lifts up your smoke, determines how fast it, it rises, and the buoyancy direction determines which direction constitutes up. So let's have a look at a few of these. So first of all, let's look at our friend buoyancy. So I've increased the value of buoyancy here on the left pyrosolver to 15, and it's remaining at 4.5 on the right here. So if we play our simulation, what we should see, as we expect, is this left-hand simulation rises up much more rapidly than the right-hand one. And that's because the same temperature is being generated, uh, but it's having a much more dramatic effect on the speed of the smoke upwards. So let's uh, now have a look at some of the fields here on the combustion tab. Let me return to the main take. So the ignition temperature determines whether or not your fuel is going to ignite. If your temperature locally is higher than this value, then your fuel will ignite and you'll have a burning reaction. The burn rate uh, determines how rapidly your fuel is burnt. So the this is a value between 0 and 1. So if this was set to 1, then all the fuel that was present would burn away in a single second. Here, as you can see, with a value of 0 0.9, this uh, does mean that uh, the, there's a little bit of fuel left at the end of every second. The fuel inefficiency 
controls how much of the fuel is actually used. So the burn rate relates to how, really how much flame and smoke is, is, is emitted for every unit of fuel. The fuel inefficiency tells you how much fuel is actually burnt. The temperature output scales the amount of temperature that's being produced and the gas released value expands your gas more rapidly or less rapidly. So let's start, start by having a look at the burn rate. And I've got the left hand solver set up with a burn rate of 0 0.3 and the right hand solver set up with the default burn rate of 0 0.9. So let's play through our simulation. And we could see quite quickly that the burn rate is acting as a sort of overall control for how much smoke and flames are being produced. Let's now look at the temperature output. So again, we've got a temperature output here of 4 on the left hand side and a temperature output of 0.15 on the right hand side. So we're going to get a lot more temperature being produced for the same amount of fuel on the left hand side. And what we can see straight away is that that's creating a much more dramatic flame. It's rising much more rapidly. And that's, of course, because the increased temperature that's being output affects the buoyancy and our flame is going to rise more quickly. Let's look now at the gas released parameter. So this time on the left hand side, we've got a gas released of 30. And on the right hand side, we've got uh, a gas released of 14. So there's roughly twice as much uh, gas released on the left hand side as the right. And if you remember, gas released is the broad control that determines how much your smoke and flames are going to expand by. So it's controlling the divergence field. And we can see that the flames and smoke are expanding much more rapidly on the left hand side. And I can just show you the divergence field. So let's go back to the first tab here. I'm going to go back to the main take. And this should allow me to visualize the divergence field and turn off the multi field. And we can see uh, that the divergence value, let me just do the same here. The divergence value, you may be able to not be able to see very much, but in fact, the divergence value here on the left hand side is much higher inside our source, and therefore it's, it's expanding our smoke more quickly. Let me revert these both to showing the smoke and flame visualization. So as I mentioned earlier, the tabs at the bottom here give you finer grained control over your flames, your smoke and so on. So here on the flame tab, one of the main controls is the so-called flame height control. And although it's called flame height, uh, what it's actually doing is, and you can see here from the help, uh, that it is in fact changing the cooling applied to the flames. Now cooling is a bit of a misleading, misleading term here because in fact what it's talking about is how rapidly your flames disappear. Uh, as I mentioned, what tends to happen is that the burn field will reinforce your flames, uh, but at the same time there's a dissipation effect, uh, an evaporation effect, which is causing your flames to disappear. So it's the balance between the, f the burning fuel, which is creating new flames, and this tendency of the flames to evaporate. Uh, and that tendency of the flames to evaporate is being controlled in part by this parameter here. So with higher values, the flames will evaporate less quickly and therefore you'll get a bigger flame. So I think I've got a take set up here for this. So let's have a look at that flame height. So in this case, on the left hand side, we've got a flame height of 0 0.5 
and on the right hand side we've got a flame height of the default which is 3.5 so what we should see uh, is that the flames on the left hand side here are really very small whereas on the right hand side they're quite tall and they're expanding up to the top there If you want really fine-grained control of your flames, uh, we can also link them to, for example, the temperature field. So what this is doing is saying that where your temperature field is very high, sorry, sorry, very low, where the temperature is very low, you're getting a lot of that evaporation of the flames, if you like. Uh, whereas when the temperature is very high, you're getting almost no evaporation of the flames. Uh, and you can use this again to lengthen your flames. I think I have a example here. So in this case, uh, the right hand, sorry, the left hand pyrosolver, we've reversed that graph so that there's no evaporation at low temperatures and the very high evaporation at high temperatures and what that's going to do is probably to ensure that almost all our flames evaporate immediately and don't rise up out of our simulation. So this gives you a very fine grain control of how long your flames are going to linger in your simulation, how high they will rise up. So let's now have a look at the smoke tab. Now I mentioned earlier that if we turn off emit smoke, let's just uh, do that. I think I've got a take uh, set up for that. So in this take uh, we're turning off the emission of smoke in the left hand simulation and we can see we get nothing. And the reason for that as I mentioned earlier is that you have to have density for mantra and indeed the visualization system to recognize that you've got a simulation. So you do need to have a density field. So in general you will want to emit smoke even if you're not going to render it. Uh, let's have a look at uh, some of these other controls here. So create dense smoke uh, I'm not going to demonstrate here. In general what happens when you create smoke is that you only add smoke to the extent that smoke doesn't already exist in the place where you're adding it. So if you already have quite dense smoke there then your burn reaction will only add sufficient to get the density of your smoke up to one. It will never produce smoke or rarely produce smoke which has a density greater than one. If you want to simulate for example uh, a volcano uh, then in general you'll want to have smoke densities greater than one in which case you can enable this parameter and that will ensure that your smoke has values greater than one and that can tend to produce a heavier more billowy smoke. You can decide where your smoke is going to come from. Either it's produced directly from the burn reaction uh, which is the process that I described earlier on when I did the presentation on the combustion reaction or well, the default is that it comes from heat. In other words, uh, that your smoke is going to be produced from your flames. And there are some controls down here which determine how much smoke is produced. So obviously, if I was to increase the smoke amount, which I'll do, uh, or decrease it rather, so we've got a smoke amount now of 0.3 here on the left, and a smoke amount of one on the right. So let's reset our simulation and what we should see is that as you would expect we're in the same amount of flames on both sides but getting much less smoke here on the left. The other thing uh, that this smoke tab uh, allows you to do is determine 
which part of your flames, in other words the heat field, will produce smoke. Now in a real fire, if you think about it, uh, what tends to happen is that the smoke in general, this is not always true, is only produced at the very top of the flames. What you see is bright flame at the bottom, the flames rise up and towards the tips of the flames the smoke will start to be emitted. Uh, so what this is doing is saying that only where the heat is lower than this uh, value here, so 0.2, only when it's lower than that will you create, create smoke. Now since in general uh, the temperature and indeed the, the strength of the heat field gets less the further away you get from your source, what this is going to do is tend to make the smoke come from the tips of your flames. Uh, and I've got a, a take, I think, set up for this. So let's have a look at that. Uh, so in this case, what we're doing here is having a heat cutoff of 0.8. And that means that much more of the flame is going to produce smoke because almost any value of heat uh, between 0 to 0 0.8 is going to produce smoke only the very um, hottest part of the flame from 0.8 to 1 is not going to produce any smoke whereas on the right here we've got the the standard value so what we should see let's have a look here is that more smoke is being emitted uh, but also and it may be a little hard to see on the video you can see that this uh, simulation on the left here looks paler and the reason it looks paler is that there is smoke in between the flames here and the camera and that's giving the flames the sort of washed out effect so what's happening here is that even in the sort of densest part of the flames we're producing both flames and smoke and that is creating this sort of washed out effect so that can be quite a useful control for tweaking the appearance of your simulation. The final control here, which I haven't uh, got a take to demonstrate, is a blending control so that your smoke just doesn't start suddenly appearing at a particular point in your flame, but is, is blended. So if you increase this amount, then the amount of that blending increases and more of the, the flame that the sort of transition from no smoke to smoke across the length of your flame will, will broaden if you increase this value. So just to recap uh, again, the presentation I did earlier was looking at the production of smoke from your burn field. In fact the default is to produce it from your heat field uh, using the parameters here. Let's now have a look at the gas tab. So the gas tab determines, along with this parameter here, gas released, how fast uh, your smoke and flames will expand. And it has these two other parameters, burn contribution and flame contribution, which determine uh, whether uh, that, it, that they affect the gas release parameter in effect. So because this burn contribution is one, that means that the burn field will be contributing to the expansion of the gas uh, with a value of one. So every uh, the value of the burn field is basically being copied across into the divergence multiplied by the amount of gas released here. The flame contribution allows you to also expand uh, your gas based on the heat field as well as the burn field and the default here is that it's mainly the burn field that's determining the expansion of your gas with a small contribution from the heat field and let's have a look at the temperature tab and this is determining how much your temperature is going to increase related to the flames and to the burn so this allows you to produce the temperature output that's given here 
except that the, the thing that's multiplied by the temperature output is either the burn field, depending on this coefficient, or the heat field, the flames, according to this coefficient. Again, I, I haven't demonstrated this. Uh, and you can also have a control here which allows you to ensure that your flames continue uh, to keep uh, the simulation warm, uh, that you can reduce the amount of cooling that happens where you have a flame. And the final tab simply allows you to add vect fuel and I don't think I've got a, a take set up for this so let's just uh, do it anyway. So let's set up the advection of fuel here on the left hand side and let me give it quite a high speed and what this is going to do is to ensure that our fuel isn't just stationary here at the bottom but it's going to be lifted up with the flames and that will tend to create a much more dramatic flame effect because we will actually have burn reactions going right right up here so let me just and we can see that that's producing a really dramatic big explosive type flame and if we visualize here the turn off the visualization of the simulation and visualize our burn field we can see that because our fuel is, is just here at the bottom in the sphere in our right hand simulation um, the burn field is also just limited to the right hand to, to the sphere in the right hand simulation Whereas in the left-hand simulation, uh, that fuel has been advected out, so it's, it's covering a much larger area and therefore creating smoke and flames over a much larger area.